Thank you, Sadhguru. Now we have, I invite Maya, PhD from Colombia. Maya has uh, been on the front Maya. line for almost the last uh, eight weeks or so, and she has put her heart and soul, along with her colleague, they've tried really hard, and they've set an example for the rest of the country to follow them and navigate these uh, tough times. Maya? Well, good afternoon or good evening. Good evening, it's yeah. evening here. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me here today. And it's a pleasure to be and an honor to be with this panel and um, with you, Sadhguru. It's my, say, it's my privilege, you're, you're the brave warrior right now. <laughs> thank you very much for what you're doing. Thank you, I look forward to your insights. To, to put things into perspective, I wanted to present kind of how things evolved in New York. And they did evolve similar to how it, they did around the world. But there were three um, emotions or three things what, that we faced as we were managing this disease. At first, there was this feeling of ambiguity. We had um, very little understanding of the disease process. And although it was similar to other diseases, we still were not really quite sure how to manage it. We had, there's a feeling of lack of control we had limited resources to be able to manage this disease. We still don't have a cure, we don't have a vaccine, and we don't have reliable and effective therapies for all of this. And it was a prolonged course, um, as Bala was saying, eight weeks and still counting. We were at the epicenter, but still other, we've learned, we've seen what happened in Asia and in Europe. It's a prolonged course for the patients who are at the ho in the hospital. It's a decided to dedicate themselves to reaching out to families to provide the support that they need. They would call them every day, relay medical information, provide interpretation of this information, and help them navigate all of that um, information. They provided the emotional support that the families needed, the psychological support, and they advocated on their behalf and on behalf of the patients. This humanistic effort really reminded us of why we went into medicine in the first place. So that was um, a ray of hope for us as we went into all of this. The challenges that okay. we faced though were- I can new, hear her. And they changed the, feed. Um, the different phases of this process. The first phase we really had to get people to do the work that we needed. We needed people on the ground to be the warriors that we expect. We called them heroes and we appealed to their sense of duty and everybody answered that call. That was the easy phase of building a response of making sure that patients were well cared for immediately as the impact was hitting New York. The second phase was a little bit harder. And as things settled, we had to keep a sort of realistic optimism we had to make sure that the focus was on the light at the end of that tunnel, but we did not know if there was a light at the end of that tunnel. We didn't know how long it would last. And managing those conversations, making sure that we kept motivating people past that moment was a challenge. The real challenge for us right now is how do we make meaning 
of something that seems so senseless? How do we make sense of something that is so senseless? How do we embrace the sufferings that has happened, the separation of families and patients, the lost lives, the lost livelihood, the economic downfall, the lost educational opportunities for many. Lives have been upended. How do we take the time to grief some of that? The passing of a world as we once knew it that is probably not going to come back. And how do we prepare ourselves for the next stage? Those are my questions. I, I just wanted to ask you, Maya, uh, just in New York City, for example, or New York State, uh, are the hospitals like fully inundated or is it still the medical capacity is still available? At, at the peak of our response, we did feel inundated. Um, we had to create intensive care unit beds when beyond our capacity. So we doubled our capacity in our hospital alone. And that's true across the hospital system and across different hospitals across the country. The emergency rooms were inundated. Mm -hmm. No patient was turned away from our doors. And um, we were very grateful that we were able to offer the help for anybody who came to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Bala, is she, is she taking it ahead or should I answer this question? Yes, Sadhguru, uh, I think that was a question, how do we, um, you know, face these challenges, right Maya? Yes, so how do, we, how do we create meaning? How do we find meaning in something that is very difficult to, to understand? How do we refocus our energies for the next phase and to start the healing process for everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredible of you and whoever, all the others who have worked with you that uh, as doctors, instead of just attending to the medical dimension of the problem, uh, you're looking at it in a humanistic way about families and, uh, you know, the anxiety that uh, when somebody is locked up in a hospital and you don't know whether they're going to live or die and you don't have any connect contact with them is uh, an unbearable torture for the loved ones. So it's really wonderful that uh, you have reached out to that uh, need. But can we make meaning out of this? Can we somehow console ourselves, it's all okay someday? That's not how life is, it is just that, well, well, you and me are, are talking to each other, so both of us are alive through the pandemic, which is a great blessing. And this is true for everybody else who've survived, especially in places like New York where so many have been hit by this. Well, we need to look at it this way, that this is a situation which has brought mortality right up in everybody's faces. That human life is very fragile and we are mortal creatures. For just about anything we can die. Every day, uh, a whole, uh, you know, uh, probably uh, some hundred thousand, two hundred thousand people are dying of natural causes. It is just that, I mean, as doctors you may be seeing it, where most other people, they don't realize that this is the nature of our existence. If everybody was conscious that we are a mortal nature, when I say mortal, it simply means that uh, we have a limited lease of time and it's just ticking away all the time. If everybody was conscious of this, where would people have time to fight with somebody? Where would people have time to abuse each other? Where would people have time to do anything that doesn't really matter to them? Nobody would have time. So in many ways, this virus and uh, the, you know, the conversation that's happening in the world about it, has brought mortality right up in everybody's faces. Nobody can escape it. So at a time like this, it is not a, a time to console ourselves, it's a time to use this as a realization. How should we live our lives? What should we do differently in this world? What should we do, do differently within ourselves and around ourselves? And the value of our humanity, 
must become the prime factor right now. It is not just when people are uh, infected and dying, the value of we being human is the most important thing. When I say the value of being human, every other creature in the world is always structured within itself, in its very intrinsic instincts, it is structured to build bound boundaries around itself, always wanting to live within a safety boundary. This is how all creatures are designed. It is only the human being where our intelligence has flowered, our consciousness has come to a place where we want to expand, we want to, you know, break our barriers. This longing is there only in, hum in human beings in this… on this planet at least. So when we have this intrinsic need to en enhance our boundaries, enhancing our boundaries means inclusion, inclusiveness of our existence. When this is the basic, uh, you know, uh, intrinsic value that we have, it is not a value that's been taught to us. It is natural for every human being, wherever they are, they want to be little more, little more, little more all the time in their lives. But this little more is finding very, uh, what to say, very minuscule uh, installments of expansion. But actually, if you look at it now, if our mortality is right in our faces, if we want to really expand, if we want to break our boundaries, this is the time. We must use this. Well, so many lives have been, you know, been paid for this. Too much cost of life has happened. Well, economy is ruined in so many places almost across the world. Uh, there is going to be poverty, there are starvation issues, there are many, many things happening. When all this is happening, we must use this as a point of realization. There is nothing to understand, it's death. It's death or on the way. Death does not mean the virus brought death to us. We are all dying kind, but virus is just preponing what we are supposed to live our full lives and die, but vi virus is just bringing it right now in front of us. So, this must be time for realization, not for consolation. It is all right, we are hurt. We have lost dear ones. We… Uh, our economies are hurt, our lifestyle, lifestyles have been lost. Now, once this, you know, here in India and everywhere else, we are in lockdown condition. It's almost seven weeks that uh, totally everybody has not stepped out of their homes. Now, uh, partial uh, relaxing is happening. Now, when we step out, most people have lost their jobs, businesses are, uh, you know, ruined, all kinds of things. These problems will come, but right now our concern is just to stay alive. But those of us who stay alive, those of us who stay alive beyond this pandemic spread in the world, we must understand the most important value is that we are human. That means we are capable of being inclusive, not exclusive. Right now we have created a social and international structure where it's all about exclusiveness. Even if you just, just see any advertisement on the boards, everybody is talking about exclusiveness as if it's a great value. The very nature of human being is we want to expand, that's why we are so different from other creatures. We are the only ones who are referred to as beings, that means we can choose how to be. Other animals just act out of their basic instincts, but we can choose how to be. This is a time that we make, must become conscious, this must be a point of realization of how we wish to be. How do we wish to spend our lives on this planet? What do we wish to do with each other? What do we wish to do with the rest of the life on this planet? The planet itself, what do we wish to do? This is a time of realization for all of us. The sufferings of the people who have been infected and recovered, the loss of life that's happened and all the economic suffering that is going to unfold in the next few months, all this should not go waste. We must bring humanity to a new level of realization, the significance of being human, the importance of our humanity. Thank you, Maya, and thank you, Sadhguru. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Lakhman Foro, our next panelist. Um, he's going to talk about the ethical aspects of this um, pandemic. Lakhman. All right. Thanks, Bala, um, and thanks, Good morning. Sadhguru. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and I had some slides I was going to run through. Can we show those or will that work? Yes, um, they should be ready for the slides. Yeah. So I was just going to say, since Bala had asked me to talk about ethics, um, I can't see, are the slides there? 
Yeah, um, you change your view, zoom view. Okay, so I can see. So so ethics 101, I say. So what even what is ethics? Next slide. Um, uh, I think one of the problems when people think about ethics is they think about it being rules, and that's not actually in thousands of years of human history what's been most powerful about ethics. Um, it's really been about ideals, aspirations, the human spirit. And examples, next slide, the moral heroes of the 20th century are people like Mahatma Gandhi, who inspired millions of people with a vision that the current world of the caste system in India was not actually what reality could be. And another hero, next slide, in the United States, Dr. Martin Luther King, who showed people that the racism, the black-white differences, that is not what humanity is. He had a dream that inspired people. And the next slide, and then all over the world, Nelson Mandela, even in prison, did not accept apartheid. He showed people nobody believed that South Africa could peacefully transition the way that it did. The leaders there uh, inspired the spirit within people. My hero, next slide, in a lot of ways, is uh, uh, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, um, uh, who uh, in this slide embodied the fact that um, uh, we think in English, the words moral and morale or different, um, but actually uh, going back, whoops, going back years ago in Latin, they were the same word moralis, that the highest energy that people have is moral energy and the highest morale. Next slide. Um, and Albert Schweitzer himself, next slide, um, in his 20s was a great theologian, a great box scholar, but he found himself yearning for more and decided to go in medicine. Next slide. Um, uh, as a scholar, uh, he uh, uh, really believed in science and truth. He said reverence for truth must be exalted about all else. He had faith in knowledge. Today we're hearing about science is going to save us. He actually believed that in his 20s. Next slide. But then he went to uh, 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 Africa, and even though he thought science was going to save humanization, next slide. Um, when he was there in the hospital in Africa, World War I broke out and people were destroying each other thanks to science and technology. Next slide. Um, uh, and using that science uh, uh, really to end life. Next slide. Um, and what he realized was that science by itself could destroy human civilization. That's not what ethics is really about, is mastering science. Next slide. Um, uh, and uh, studying uh, in desperation all over the world, he actually found, next, uh, next line, um, that reverence for truth is not the basis of human life. We have deep within ourselves, every human being, what he called reverence for life. But he found the same concept in every faith, tradition, or language around the world, in Buddhism, in Jainism, in Hinduism, the spark within every individual human being, next slide, um, uh, to experience within ourselves this life force, to realize that every life around us has the same life force, and as Sadhguru was saying, and we have that in common together, that is our greatest strength. The science is the tools, but really the greatest power is that human spirit, next slide. Um, uh, the two ethics challenges that I wanted to just mention here, Bala, I've been deeply involved here in Massachusetts with questions about, uh, are we going to have to ration ventilators? Um, there was a lot of criticism about the different rules and guidelines, got into technical details. Um, the quote here from uh, Winston Churchill says, democracy is the worst form of government except all the others. So all the efforts to ration ventilators and who's going to get one or not get one, all of them had problems. But I would say the most valuable thing in all of those conversations was everybody Everybody that I heard comment agreed with the basic moral principle, which is if we have a scarce resource like a ventilator, an ICU bed, any of those things, every single human life should have an equal right to that. Every single human life is of equal value. It doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or poor, whether you're a prisoner or homeless, every life's of equal value. And I think that that has been a great crystallizing um, that has come out of that, a realization we were just here. Um, the second thing is that we all learned that what we wanted to do was never have to ration ventilators. 
And that couldn't be figured out within the hospitals. And so we appealed as people in New York and elsewhere did to the entire community to flatten the curve, to stay at home. And thanks to that in New York and Massachusetts and elsewhere, we're not rationing ventilators, right? So that was again, the human spirit of solidarity. We're all in this together, um, uh, really prevented us having to do that. Next slide. And then the current problem that I'm current focusing on is in Massachusetts and all over the country, as this slide shows, most of the deaths are actually taking place outside of hospitals in nursing homes where frail elders are. And again, people are thinking about that as a technical problem. We need more testing. We need more PPE. Those things are all crucially important. Um, but increasingly in conversations with people at CDC and other places, we've realized the numbers, the technical things are not the crucial thing. The crucial thing is we all need to realize that every single person in every nursing home is a human being, is someone's mother or father or grandmother, grandfather. We celebrated Mother's Day and the Archdiocese, the Catholic Church in Massachusetts is calling on everyone to think about every person as an individual. And the single most important thing, increasingly people are realizing if we want the people in nursing homes to be safe, yes, the testing and, and all of that's important, but it's human beings taking care of our grandparents in the nursing homes, including immigrants paid $12 an hour, certified nursing assistants, and we have to support their spirit um, so that they will come and take joy in their work. And if we do that, we can solve all the technical problems. So it's all spiritual and moral, the technical tools then we'll use properly. Great, okay, is that, um, thank you so much, Lachlan. So uh, along the lines of what Lachlan had said, um, Sadhguru has been in touch with all the um, meditators you may call, and um, he has been telling us to at least take care of one elderly for each of these meditator long ago, almost six, seven weeks ago. So that is almost the same message that Lachlan is giving, um, taking care of treating them as individual lives and also taking care of these uh, elderly. So do you have any uh, thoughts on that, Lachlan? Yes, I, I, um, I, I believe that um, uh, as we realize that these are not statistics, right? Thousands of deaths, um, but just uh, half a mile from me, there's a nursing facility. Most of my neighbors haven't gone there. And we're just starting to think, what can we do to support the staff there? So they come to work. They're not afraid. It may be that to support the staff, it's not what happens in the nursing facility. These staff are actually scared because they're immigrants. They live in a crowded home. And if we haven't helped their own parents be safe in their home, they can't come to work. So it's all human scale problems that I think each one of us will find joy and satisfaction when we realize we can make a difference. Thank you, Sadhguru. <clears throat> well, uh, we can approach this in many different ways. Whatever human beings uh, have been trying to stir, uh, you know, compassion and inclusiveness in other human beings, but when crisis come, when war comes, when other kinds of situations of uh, survival issues, of sharing food, economic values, things like that, then all this is forgotten and we become like that. At least at times like this, when all of us are under equal kind of threat, it is not like one is better off than the other. Uh, this realization coming is very good. If… Uh, if there is a few minutes, I could just explore this in a more technical way. Uh, <clears throat> the thing is, uh, one… one reason why uh, the world has to rev itself up to act in terms of somebody else's well-being is, our education systems are designed like this, that the only dimension of intelligence that we employ in our day-to-day -day life is our intellect. As you know, if I ask a simple question, would you like uh, for anybody, if they would like their intellect to be sharp or dull, definitely they would say sharp. So obviously, intellect is a cutting instrument. So whatever you give to the intellect, it will dissect. So if you apply just your intellect without 
making use of other dimensions of intelligence within us, which are more inclusive in nature, intellect will naturally cut everything into small pieces. So in people's minds, everything has become separate. There is no inclusive experience, though they are breathing, which is a very inclusive experience. You don't have a separate gas chamber of your own, you are breathing the atmosphere as everybody else is breathing. What uh, whoever you think is your enemy, what he breathes out, you may, you may be breathing in and you have no issues, your body has no issue at least. So, life in its essence is inclusive, but human intellect naturally is exclusive because that is the nature of the intellect, because it's a scalpel, it is a, a dissecting instrument. So when entire education system uses just this one instrument for acqu acquisition of knowledge, naturally uh, the world and social situations become very uh, exclusive, everybody for themselves kind of stuff. Now, uh, yesterday somebody was asking me, a uh, twelve-year-old uh, child in the house uh, right now complaining because there is a lockdown in India, Mm, I want my me time, I don't want any of you here <laughs> A twelve-year-old child wants a me time, uh, that, that my own time. There is no my own time or your own time, we are all existing in the same times, all right? But now we have become so exclusive, we think we have our own chamber of time, our own chamber of breath, our own chamber of everything. Everything is what is mine, what is yours. This is essentially because we are employing just one dimension of intellect. As everybody knows and people talk about it as if it's some kind of a conflict between heart and head and all this stuff, because essentially the emotional intelligence is more inclusive. The intellectual intelligence is more exclusive, so they're struggling with that. Having said that, in yoga we look at it like this, there are four dimensions of one intellig one's intelligence. The first one, which is the intellect, we call it buddhi, the intellect has to be sharp, it's like a knife. Without the sharpness of this intellect, your survival will be uh, in jeopardy. You cannot survive well in this world if you don't have a discriminatory mind. It's very, very important for that. But it's only for survival. And survival is not a complete process for a human being. For every other creature on this planet, if their stomach becomes full, their life is settled. That's not the way a human being operates. When stomach is empty, there's only one problem, when stomach is full, there are hundred problems for the human being, because human life begins only after survival is taken care of. Till then, we are also just one more creature. So, what we call as human is not fulfilled by the survival process, so intellect alone or using just the intellect is not good enough. So, the next dimension of intelligence is called as manas, which is a massive silo of memory. When I say massive silo of memory, it contains various levels of memory, most of it human beings may not be conscious about. There is evolutionary memory, there is uh, genetic memory, there is karmic memory, there is conscious memory, there is unconscious memory, there is articulate and inarticulate levels of memory. Like this, there are eight dimensions of memory. But this silo is deciding who you are right now. You may not be conscious of it, but the very shape of your body is memory. Now my skin is the way it is because it remembers my forefathers. I may not have seen them, but my skin knows exactly what my fore forefathers look like. So, you might have forgotten how your great-great-grandfather was, but his nose may be sitting on your face. So, the, this whole thing, what you call as myself, the very body, is memory. It is enormous amount of memory. This memory one may not be conscious of, but it's playing its role in everything that we do. The very way we sit and stand, right now people are talking about genetic factors being a significant aspect in who gets infected, to what extent this infection will affect the individual person. Some of the scientists are talking in terms of how the genetic markers are very important for this. So genetics means what? It is another kind of memory that we have got from our ancestors. So, this whole thing that I call as myself is memory. How profoundly will you get to access it is the only question, not everybody gets to access it the same way. Between this silo of memory and the intellect, there is a connection which is the identity. How you identify yourself accordingly to that extent you can access the memory. 
If your identity is that of your individual self, which essentially is built around your physical frame and your mental frame, then what you access is very limited. So, in the yogic culture, first of all, let me describe the word yoga. The word yoga means union. Union means what you think as your individual self. Though we are a minuscule life in this existence, creation has given us an individual experience. The problem is, people have taken their individual experience rather too seriously. So seriously, they think they are a world by themselves. So all the sufferings and the nonsense that people are going through is simply because they are a separate world from the world. That is the whole problem. So they have taken their individuality so seriously. This has happened because you're just identified with your own body, your thought, your emotion and just a few things around you. But the most important thing in human life is how we handle our identity. Depending upon how we handle our identity, that is how our intelligence and various other capabilities will function. As you just now said, uh, Sir Dr. Uh, Furrow, Furrow, right? Am I right? Uh, Furrow, that uh, you said that science, uh, you know, you when you showed that slide, science has turned against us. What is a tremendous gift? We are making a mess out of it. Human mind itself has turned against us. Most human beings are suffering their own thought and emotion most of the time. Ninety percent of the time, their suffering is not coming from outside. Ninety percent of the same time, human suffering is on self-help mode. They're just causing it to themselves. This is simply because their own intelligence has turned against us, sim against themselves, simply because the identity is not handled properly. When I say identity is not handled properly, in India there used to be a, a tr culture like this. Before you start education, at the age of twelve was when we started education for children. Before you start education, it is very… it was compulsory that you have to take a cosmic identity. Children are made to say that my identity is with the cosmos, not with my parents, not with my caste, not with my religion or race or nation. My identity is with the entire cosmos because we saw that knowledge is hugely empowering. And anybody who has a limited identity, if you empower that person, that's going to be a disaster. That is a disaster we are seeing. Right now, if you see between educated people and uneducated people, it is only the educated people who are ripping the planet apart. Uneducated people, their footprint on the planet is very, very gentle. It is only the educated who have such a heavy footprint and really ripping it apart. So this knowledge and this education, which is such a huge empowerment, is happening without a universal identity. People are identified with their small petty ambitions and whatever limited things and they're enormously empowered. Whether in… Uh, either individuals or communities or race, religion, nationality, just see these are all the points which are the points of conflict. It is the religions clashing against each other, races treating each other so badly and nations continuously in conflict for so many centuries. We are not able to solve this simply because limited identity with something or the other. So, first and foremost thing that needs to happen in the world is that people must have a larger identity, a universal identity. We are all busy singing our own national anthems. It's time we sing, sing a global anthem that before one gets empowered, I think all of you doctors take that oath, I don't know if that's a practice in… Uh, I'm sure it is even in America, right? That yes. Hippocrates yes. oath. Yes. So in a way, it's mm -hmm. a universal identity that you're taking. Before you become a doctor, you're taking a oath, no matter who they are, my identity is not with this and that, my identity is with larger humanity. So this kind of identity is very, very important. If we don't establish this identity, our intelligence, our capabilities, our competence will work against us. Right now, that's what is happening with us. The fourth dimension of the intelligence is referred to as chitta. Chitta is that dimension of intelligence which is unsullied by memory. The first three dimensions include memory in that, but the fourth dimension in of intelligence has no memory. What no memory means is, memory is what creates what is familiar, what is unfamiliar. Or in other words, memory is a kind of a boundary. I know you, this is my boundary, this is my friend. Oh, I don't know the other person, that is, he is out of my boundary. 
So memory is what makes us who we are. At the same time, it's a boundary by itself, it's a wall by itself. So there is a dimension of intelligence which is beyond memory, which is untouched by memory. Once you touch this dimension of intelligence, there is a sense of boundlessness and there's limitless possibility for a human being. In this state of intelligence which every human being has, which is the basis of our existence, because there is an intelligence with us, within us, that if we in, even eat a piece of bread, it turns into human body within a few hours. This is not being done in our uh, intellect, definitely this is happening in a, with a deeper intelligence. To get in touch with this dimension of intelligence is most important because the oaths that we take and the ethics that we stick on to, all these things are fine on the surface, but when real challenges come, they won't sustain us, they can break us. So it's very important, there is a profound experience within every human being that your experience of life is beyond the limitations of your own memory. So, to come to this, one fundamental tool we always establish is this, that you don't identify with your knowledge, you always identify with your ignorance, because our knowledge is so minuscule, but our ignorance is boundless. In just identifying with ignorance, our identi identity becomes a borderless space. This is important for every human being. Doctors have taken this oath that in some way they are borderless. I think some doctors in France, they have this uh, doctors beyond what? Doctors without borders. Oh, okay, doctors yes. without borders. I think every doctor is without border. Right now, uh, both in India and elsewhere in the world, uh, we are seeing that the medical personnel are doing such a fantastic job that they have become worship worthy. Thank you very much. And I just add, thank you so much. And I'm looking at Maya's name and just translating when I'm listening to that. Um, uh, not understanding the yoga details, except I've been enjoying your book, um, uh, Inner Engineering. But when I listening to Maya, why, wh when I ask, why are hundreds of human beings alive in New York because of Maya and her team? And yes, it's the knowledge, the intellectual, the scientific tools, the machine, yeah, yes, but why they are alive, really? because Maya and the nurses there cared about each individual patient as a human being, not anything about the social rank of those things, cared about those people. And Maya, I, I'm just meeting you now, but uh, I know your experience in every nurse, when you were caring the most, you were thinking the least about yourself, Maya, or myself as a nurse, you almost lost that identity but found your identity as a doctor, as a nurse, caring for those people. And that actually was the meaning and that actually kept you going. And when you could go home at the end of the day or night, knowing that you had mattered to another life, found yourself in that way, all the different dimensions Sadhguru was talking about, that's how we thrive. We are in this together. And when we actually do that and connect with each other in that way, that is how we get through this. That is a great thought, like one. Um, Maya, do you have anything to comment on? Thank you very much. It is humbling. I think. Um, it's, it's a big burden to have that as physicians in this time. There's a little bit that we know, and as I prefaced it, there's a lot that we do not know. And it was uh, this, know this knowing what, that we don't know that sometimes left us a little bit crippled of, are we doing the best that we can? Um, is this the, the best that we can offer? And I think for us, the the comfort was that we were offering ourselves in this process, that we were helping the people and not fighting a disease. And I think there is that, um, it's, a, it's a fine line, but it's, uh, I, I think I find meaning in that sense. And I'm sorry, the sounds of New York might be joining me <laughs> here at the meeting, but... Uh, we're glad uh, life, you, is, life is happening in New York. <laughs> there are lively sounds out, out there. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. Thank you, you Lachlan. And thank you, Sadhguru, for that uh, wonderful interaction. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Karen Hagberg next. Uh, she is the Chief um, Academic Officer at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And she's talking to me the uh, last couple of days about um, how they have formed, um, a group of people have formed from the entire Houston, um, and they interact on a daily basis, irrespective of which hospital they are from. So it is so heartening to hear that. Go ahead, Karen. Thank you very much for joining us. 
Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good evening, I should say to you. <laughs> so nice to be here. Uh, what an honor for me to be here amongst you, Sudo, and also my fellow panelists. So, so nice. Such a great Thank you. So I was thinking, you know, what are the positives in, that have come out of this crisis? There's so many great things. And when I really look at, at our situation, um, particularly in the Texas Medical Center, it's really the world's largest medical center. It's huge. Uh, we have over 60 medical institutions, 21 hospitals. We employ over 100,000 people. And what I saw come happen through this crisis was that we came together and we have a Texas Medical Center collaborative. And what we see and we saw is that the leaders of these different hospitals came together with good discussions, you know, because it's, it's huge. They came together on a daily basis discussing what resources they all had. Um, you know, in, you know, how many beds do we have? What's our bed capacity? What, how many ICU beds do we have? Um, how many ventilators do we have? How many anesthesia machines do we have that can provide ventilation? All of these are very precious resources that we had to take tally of and make sure we had enough to care for patients. But I think this style of communication of meeting together and talking amongst each other, talking about our strengths, our vulnerabilities, what we really had to offer for patient care. I think that has been one of the uh, beauty, beautiful things that has actually arisen out of this. Um, there is also collaboration with our local government uh, and the politicians. We had some, uh, a big event that was actually gonna happen in Houston at that time and that's the Texas Medical Center, it's the rodeo. And we have over two and a half million people that usually attend that. And that is a, a great thing that people come to. I know I don't, if you've come, but it's a phenomenal event. Mm. Um, and you know, and it's, and it's held for a really good reason. Uh, you know, it's dedicated for benefiting our youth, education, uh, better agricultural practices. So it's all for good reason that this event is held. But again, we have, they have 34,000 volunteers, my husband being one of them, who was in that event. And, um, you know, attracting so many people. So the leaders of the healthcare system advised that this event should really not happen. Um, and it was bringing a lot of money into the city, a lot of people. Into the city. But nonetheless, uh, discussions happened and they canceled it. In the middle of it, canceled. A good decision that was made with encouragement from our healthcare leaders. So we had politicians and healthcare leaders working together. I think that's also a wonderful thing, a silver lining that came out of this. You know, we often don't communicate like this. We have natural disasters, hurricanes, tropical storms here in Houston, and uh, our hospitals have been affected by these, almost you know negatively impacted with flooding of our facilities. And, and never before has there been such discussions and people coming together to talk about, you know, what to do and how to do this in a collaborative fashion. So I was, my question to you, Adur, is that don't as ask, we move... Don't ask me how to win the rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> No, I won't ask you that, because <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, but as we move beyond COVID-19, you know, and how do we get these bonds to remain? How do we get this collaboration, you know, in, in an area where it's often competitive, where hospitals are competing with one another, that we're working together, being transparent, sharing our knowledge, our information, our resources in such a collaborative way. That's a wonderful uh, thing and uh, fortunately it's happening across the world that uh, many hospital chains in India also have come together, working together. It's great to see this. Well, how to take this beyond uh, this pandemic? Uh, that is a challenge because, uh, well, 
it is uh, medicine, it is doctor's work, but still there is also a business end to it. Right now, we have kept the business end aside because there is an emergency, which is a good thing. And uh, I think it's a bit unfair to expect the same thing beyond this time because uh, today, uh, the way we have structured it, I don't completely agree with this, but that's the way we have structured it. Our medical system has such a huge, massive investment in terms of technology, buildings and you know, whatever other uh, things that are needed. When there's such a big investment, naturally it becomes a business. So once it becomes a business, it has to sustain, it has to make its profit, otherwise it will not live. The very simple factor is, what… Uh, what is not a business, what is not uh, making some profit, it may not be profiteering, but it is making some profit, that is the basis of its survival, otherwise it will not survive. Nothing can be uh, kept going forever on charity or whatever, because even those who make charity, somewhere they must be making profit, otherwise how will they do… how will they do charity? So in some other business they may be doing this. Well, the medical business could be made little less aggressively competitive than what it is in many areas. Maybe this collaboration, this hand-holding that all of you have done should make it a uh, little less aggressive kind of competition because this involves human life, this is not just another business. But uh, for whatever reasons, I think the business end of it cannot be eliminated. It could be made less sharp. Now that you've all collaborated, there is some kind of bond. I hope uh, everybody strives to keep that bond, uh, not expect a very uh, ideal or utopian situation where everybody will cooperate and always be that way. No, they, it will be competitive. But competition should not go beyond a point in medical industry because human lives are involved. Thank you, Thank Sadhguru. You. Thank you, Sadhguru. Uh, that's very good advice. I'm hopeful that we can remain just as communicative going forward after this crisis. Um, you know, you had mentioned in a lot of discussion today about human life and um, the importance right now that we, we, we work together and uh, make these great decisions for our patients. And that is one of the big di dilemmas that we face, and I'm sure all the hospitals have faced, with, you know, balancing the safety and, of our patients and our employees with the care of our patients. Um, we've had to make some difficult decisions, you know, as to um, you know, the balance in, 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 in people coming into our facility, whether they be employees or patients. And uh, these are often difficult decisions to make. And we're facing the same decisions as we kind of go back and uh, go back into the, you know, getting back to normal. So there's a lot of decisions that have to undergo. You know, MD Anderson has one of the largest and densest um, concentration of immunocompromised patients in the world. So, you know, we have the responsibility to protect their health and their safety at all times. So we've had to, you know, decrease operational and research activity in order to protect our patients and our employees. And that this is an organization that is known for its strength in these areas. So we have to make a lot of decisions and I, I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, when it comes to making decisions, you know, what is your strategy? You know, does it, do you make your decisions based on your mind, you know, your heart, your gut, a combination <laughs> of all of this? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and then once you make a decision, you know, how do you find peace with these decisions? Uh, fortunately, my heart, my brains and my gut and my little finger also, they all operate as one, they don't operate separately, they don't create any conflict in me <laughs> But <laughs> These are times where every one of us are required to make uh, hard decisions. Well, those of you who are in medicine, you may be making uh, decisions uh, of life and death because when, you know, initially in certain European countries when it happened, some of them made decisions uh, as to who should get the ventilator, because they were limited, 
they took lots, they, it's like a lottery, who should get it? And uh, those who lost the lottery lost their lives also. And uh, otherwise they decided on the age factor, suppose me and my mother uh, went to the hospital with the same requirement, they would give it to me and let my mother die. How do I live with that? Or if me and my daughter went to the hospital, uh, they will give it to her and let me die. How does she live with that? So these are hard times. Hard times bring hard decision to all of us. It may not necessarily about life for all of us, we may not be making life decisions like the doctors are making. We have to make many livelihood decisions. Knowing fully well that somebody needs their job, many businesses have to fire their employees. Knowing very well that they need the job, they can't survive without the job, but to keep the business alive, they have to fire somebody. All these hard decisions are there. These are hard times, we are compelled to make hard decisions, but this is what is important. Though we are making hard decisions, we can still do it with absolute softness of heart, only to the extent it is necessary and nothing more, nothing less. Because the larger interest of keeping, serving the maximum number of people, if it's a medical uh, facility or the larger interest of keeping the nation's or the world's economy going because livelihoods are as important as life after some time. Initially, we talk about life, but after some time, it'll come to a place where people will say, what is the point of being alive when we can't have a livelihood? This question will naturally come up. We've not yet come there in a big way, but if this continues for another four weeks, eight weeks, definitely that will become the rhetoric of the world. People will say, what is the point being alive when we can't earn a livelihood, when we can't get our food and necessary things, can't take care of our children, what is the point being alive? This question will come. I hope we don't drive ourselves there. If we handle this little more responsibly, this is manageable because human beings are the carriers here. So if human beings uh, behave responsibly, I hear uh, in Texas some people desperately want to have a haircut, they don't mind carrying guns to have a haircut <laughs> So, <laughs> too much uh, talk of freedom is happening. This is not a time to talk about freedom, this is a time to express our responsibility to our own well-being and everybody's well-being around us. That's more important than talking about our personal freedoms. So true. Thank you, Sadhguru, and thank you, Karen. Uh, next up, I want to invite uh, Dr. Anand from Stanford, um, the pioneer in, um, you know, telling us about the pediatric pain. Namaskaram, Satsri Akal. <laughs> Namaskaram, Sadhguru. Wonderful to be with you this morning. So, Sadhguru, uh, about 12 years ago, um, I had uh, published a paper, it was titled, love, pain, and intensive care. And I made an argument in this paper to, you know, practice medicine, uh, which is relationship-based rather than protocol-based or evidence-based. And a lot of my colleagues sort of criticized uh, me for that. But uh, I want to ask you, what is the state of mind in which any doctor should approach their patient? You… you must be like a mother to the world, there's no other way to approach. <laughs> because when somebody has an ailment, they have become vulnerable like a child. He may be a big man elsewhere, but once he gets sick, he has become vulnerable like a little child, almost like an infant they become. So when they have become like that, you must become a mother, there is no other way. Wonder wonderful, that is so beautifully encapsulating in, in so many… at so many different levels. And, you know, I have in my practice tried to inculcate this habit of approaching my patients with… with love and with reverence. Um, and… Um, and… but I feel very limited. I sp spent many years in medical training and so on. Um, uh, and that taught me how to practice medicine. How do I sense what my patients are experiencing. Uh, how does any doctor sense what, what the patient may be experiencing or going through? <clears throat> See, uh, 
your medical knowledge of a particular ailment might have taught you, well, this is what is happening in this person's heart, this is what is... all the reports may be telling you, this is the condition of the heart, this is the condition of the liver or whatever, the gallbladder, whatever it is <laughs> But each individual will not go through the same problem in the same way. One person may be going through it with very minimal suffering, another person may be going through the same problem with enormous suffering. This is very individual. This... this cannot be judged by looking at the... Uh, you know, the data that you have on your hand from all the tests and MRIs and whatever else that you do. It's important to look at the patient and see what is their state, in some way empathize with them, to feel what's happening with them and accordingly it should be treated because human body and the mechanism of what we are calling as human, uh, uh, you know, system is uh, not all absolutely like a machine, that you replace this part, everything will be okay, you do that, everything will be fine, that's not how it is. Being doctors with uh, so much experience, you know that if you are immensely knowledgeable, you still, in terms of how this creation is, it is a minuscule of what it really is. So, having said that, I'm not trying to discredit uh, the med medical education and medical uh, profession. Yes, they have done fantastic job, but still, they are not creators of life. They are doing the best that they can do, but nobody has understood this human mechanism absolutely. It is only in parts we are able to intervene and do miraculous things, but still those miraculous things are very limited miracles. There is no such thing as we know exactly this is what is happening. Because the same conditions or the same data that you have, how it is in one person and how it is in the other person is very different. Here, human... Mm, what to say, certain level of connectedness. I'm... I... if I use the word empathy, compassion, these are emotional things. It... if you become emotional about your patients, I don't think it, you will get a judicious uh, judgment of what needs to be done. But being connected with what's happening, treating that body as my own, I think if a doctor develops that possibility within themselves, it'll be truly fantastic. Getting emotional will lead to maybe a little bit of solace for the patient, but may not be a solution. You make them feel good, but you don't solve their problem, that's not it. But the, if you have a certain sense of connectedness, if you have some yoga with them, yoga means some union with the people that you touch, then there is a sense of... a deeper sense of connect in that. In that, both solutions will come and solace will also happen to the patient. Because initially, a sole... the patient needs comfort. First of all, a patient needs to relax with the doctor to... to be able to be receptive to whatever they have to offer. Today, we may be looking at treatment mechanism as purely pharmaceutical or chemical treatments for everything or surgical treatments for everything, but there are dimensions. There are dimensions of human connect which is not about pharmaceuticals, which is not about surgical uh, status, but there are... there is a connection between us and everything else in this world, like the earth that we walk upon, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink. Similarly, another body which is... which... which is in front of us right now, there is a certain connectivity. In that connection, there is... there are better solutions. The knowledge that a doctor carries can be better utilized if there is a deeper connect with the patient and that connection, if it comes without uh, emotional drama attached to it, it will do very, very well. Both for the doctor, it will be enormously fulfilling and for the patient, of course, the solution is you... one wants to get well. Thank you, Sadhguru. That just blows away the clouds of confusion and I, I want to ask a follow-up question is, what's the... is that the difference between a doctor and a healer? Uh, like, how do... how do I learn to become a healer or a healing presence um, when I'm with my patient? Uh, the word healer uh, is a bit of a problem. 
<laughs> for me <laughs> because there are too many people. Right now in India, there is a joke going around, uh, uh, certain people who claim themselves healers, they're all frustrated with the lockdown. They are just waiting, remove the lockdown, let this pandemic go, after that we can heal everybody. If you're a healer, this is the time to do it <laughs> when every… so many people are sick, but uh, they are waiting for the pandemic to pass. I think you… Mm. it is great that you're a doctor, I'm glad that you're not a healer. But uh, <laughs> the word heal is not a bad word, but it's been used with wrong context by people. When you say healer, miracle healers doing all kinds of funny things. And uh, if you do not know this, American healers are coming to India, and Indian healers are going to America. This is a Indo-American exchange program. Because in your own place it never works, <laughs> you need a strange lot of people to make it work. Once uh, there was one big American healer here operating in India and gathering thousands of people on the beach in Marina Beach in uh, Chennai. So the journalist came and asked me, Sadhguru, this man is capable of healing just any ailment, whatever it is, Crippled people just stand up and walk, blind can see, this will happen, that will happen. Then I said, if he can heal everything, what is he doing on the beach? Beach is for healthy people, not for sick people. If you want sick people, I will give you the addresses of ten thousand hospitals in India. Let him go there and heal the sick, sicker in the hospital, not on the beach. Why are you meeting people on the beach? So, I'm glad you're a doctor in the hospital. Don't ever call yourself a healer, but uh, <laughs> it is important <laughs> it is important that doctors connect with their patients, not necessarily emotionally. It is not about compassion, it's not about empathy. It is most important thing is your competence and skills that you have, not your compassion and stuff. But the connectivity between two lives is always there, nobody can deny that. In that, your skills, your competence, and above all, the patient's ability to receive what is offered to him will… will become enhanced. In that, there will be better results for everybody. Yeah. Thank wow. you. Thank you, Dr. Anand, for your uh, wonderful work with children. And uh, thank you for all the questions. Especially when it comes to one... children, if I can say something, I'm glad that you worked on this children's pain. Because uh, whatever you do to the child, you know, people think a child is always crying anyway. So whatever he may be going through, no, <laughs> nobody knows what he's going through because many of them are too young to speak or anything. They are going through enormous pain, but people think children are anyway all the time cry crying. Nobody there to gauge the level of pain that may be happening on an infant especially. I'm glad you took that work up, it's most vital. Thank you. Thank you, Sadhguru. Next up, I want to invite uh, Marsha Maurer. She's the... Um, Senior Vice President of Patient Care Services at Beth Israel Lickness Medical Center. She's also a Chief Nursing Officer. Marsha? Uh, thank you. Thank Good you morning. for including. Good morning, ma'am. Thank you. Um, uh, so I am the Chief Nursing Officer, but in this COVID-19 response, my main responsibility has really been being the lead incident commander for our uh, response to COVID-19. and. Really what that's all about, we've talked a little bit earlier, uh, Dr. Faro and others about the example of vent ventilator allocation. And we're all very grateful that we haven't actually had to face that particular problem. But we in fact do have to make resource allocation decisions all the time, maybe smaller ones, but um, pretty impactful ones. So I'll give you a couple of examples and then I'll ask my question. Um, early on in this epidemic, uh, probably in the, the March period, we came to understand that um, our, our supply of masks was short, our surgical masks. We, we didn't have enough. We still don't have enough, but then we were really worried about it. But we did figure out over the first couple of weeks that uh, the virus could be transmitted by someone who wasn't symptomatic. We initially, because of our limits, uh, allocated surgical masks only to those units that were clearly caring for a COVID-19 patient. We ultimately made our way to what we do today, which is um, universal masking for all staff um, in the, and in fact patients. But in that intervening period, when we came to understand universal masking would be good, but we didn't have enough, we didn't universally allocate them. And there were circumstances where staff got infected from each other 
where staff infected patients and where uh, staff were infected by patients who we failed to see as suspect. So we made an allocation decision and we did less than we would have liked to have done and people got sick. So that's one example. Um, it's also the case right now that we've gotten a allocation of remdesivir, so that uh, antiviral drug that has shown some benefit to patients, but we didn't get enough to treat all of our COVID-19 patients. So a group of people are thoughtfully um, developing guidelines uh, and making decisions and people are starting to get it, but everyone who could, who would like to get it is not going to get it. Um, so we have, met we have methods for doing that and they're good, but at the end of the day, we will make decisions that will be imperfect and also will still lead to circumstances where uh, people are, if not harmed, at least not, well, put in harm's way. And my question to you is how do we think about the moral distress of the deciders, the people who've made those decisions and have to live with uh, the imperfect consequences of those decisions? How do, we, how do we support, how do we think about, how do we guide, how do we counsel those people making those decisions. They make good decisions, but still there's a moral distress in the decisions they make. Yes, uh, during times like this, uh, unfortunately, many of us are forced to make decisions that uh, we wouldn't want to make, but it's important that those who are most humane make these decisions based on fundamental humanity, not on any other value. There are uh, economic values to it, there are commercial aspects to it, but if our decisions are made on the basis of our humanity, but still it is… there is no such thing as a right decision, because as right. you said, we are exposing somebody to infection, we are sending somebody to death, we are… So the one who could have been saved has be… has died, one who could have… who could have died has been saved, all these things will happen because none of us make ever perfect decisions in any given situation. Nobody can make a perfect decision. With the best of our intelligence and capabilities, all we can make decisions. But let our decisions come from the core of our humanity, that is the only way we can go ahead. But is it a right decision? We don't know. We do not know whether it's a right decision. But did we do our best? It must always be so, that we always did our best, never less than that. Thank you. So you turn… one turns back to how one went about making the decision and sort of relies yes, on yes. that. Yeah, because, makes sense. Because nobody can make a perfect decision, especially in a situation like this or in any given situation. We are not making perfect decisions. It's foolish to think we have made a perfect decision. Never can we make a perfect decision. We are making a decision to the best of our intelligence, our competence and our capabilities. But Sometimes it turns out wonderfully well, sometimes it doesn't. But have we made this decision, keeping the core of our humanity as the basis for the decisions? Have we done our best? That's all the question is in our life. Is it the best? It is never the best. It is just that I've done my best. That's all we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Masha. Thank you, Sadhguru. Um, I also direct research in our hospital, at least for my department, the clinical research, so I can't uh, not ask a question about research. So I thought I'll bring in um, Dr. Senta Sadasivam, who is a vice chair for research at the Indiana University. And, um, you know, we have also done some research in the last three years or so, three years or so with um, especially the Isha Yoga, Isha Yoga. I also want to bring in Dr. Sundar Swaminathan from the University of Virginia who's uh, an expert in um, COVID, his lead article on the pathogenesis of COVID was uh, just, just came out in the American Society of Nephrology and is basically focuses on immunology research. So I request Senthil to talk a few words about what the major findings of um, yoga research that he has been involved in. Thank you, Bala. And uh, it, it was my privilege to be part of uh, the Isha research team. And we did uh, two major projects, one with uh, the four-day program and uh, the other one with the eight-day retreat. And with the four-day um, retreat, uh, we, what we saw was a significant reduction in depression and significant reduction in anxiety levels of uh, the meditators. And oh, we were, maybe that's the reason I've never been depressed. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that's uh, good to uh, hear, uh, Sadhguru. Even yesterday, I was in the operating room and uh, we had a, a COVID a, a patient, and there was so much fear and anxiety even among the physicians. And uh, it, it takes a special person to uh, have that kind of courage to take care of these patients. I think uh, the meditation and help uh, helps many people. So another finding we found was uh, we not only really looked at uh, the psychological well-being of uh, uh, the meditators, we also wanted to uh, show objectively why they feel good and how they have lower levels of depression, how they have high levels of focus. So what we did was we measured blood levels of uh, anandamide, which is an endocannabinoid. And uh, anand is bliss or uh, in Sanskrit. So what we sh showed was in about 140 patients, uh, not patients, it's meditators, before and after, we saw 70% increase in uh, anandamide and other endocannabinoids. And also uh, we saw significant 70% increase in BDNF, it's, which is a brain-derived neurotropic uh, growth. I, I won't let you test my blood, uh, then you will think I'm smoking something. Um, <laughs> th that's a good thing. Uh, I, I, I think uh, we don't need any pharmacological uh, uh, influence. Uh, in, in these uh, pandemic times, we have uh, so many, even physicians, <clears throat> depending on alcohol and uh, drugs, marijuana, we have our bodies, uh, marijuana, which is uh, an anandamide or endocannabinoid, and uh, we can have it whenever we need without any expense or side effects. So uh, I think uh, all the meditators who participated in the BSP or the four-day program uh, had that. It doesn't need a lot. Uh, all they needed to do was uh, be part of that uh, retreat and uh, they immediately got it. And it, not only that, it persisted beyond the four days. We followed all these uh, participants up to a month and they had the persistent lower levels of depression and anxiety and uh, so, and also, positive well-being, psychological well-being. That was uh, the finding. And uh, the other uh, study we did was with the eight-day program. We saw even bigger effect size in terms of 50% uh, reduction in uh, depression and anxiety. Some of our uh, the participating uh, particip participants had uh, the depression at almost 10%. Their scores went down significantly down after the program. And uh, we followed these uh, participants up to uh, three months. We saw significant uh, reduction, persistent reduction beyond uh, uh, the eight-day program up to three months. We also measured uh, their um, systemic inflammation over time, over six months period. Uh, compared to the household, their own husbands and wives at home, their stress level and uh, systemic inflammation level of the meditator was two to three-fold lower. And that was a significant uh, finding we observed. And also we showed uh, other health benefits, including better lipid profile, uh, better uh, hemoglobin A1C, which is uh, related to diabetes, was a lot uh, uh, better uh, in all these uh, participants. And also we, uh, with the collaboration with another um, uh, meditator, uh, Vijay Chandran from Florida, he was able to show uh, related to the COVID situation the meditators, the gene signature uh, improved uh, and in terms of it activated um, immune pathways, specific pathways and genes uh, over time. Just two months after the meditation, it had significant activation and uh, uh, in terms of protecting them from uh, infections like COVID. Senthil, thank you so much for that uh, brief uh, description and hopefully all these papers will come out. We know that we have almost half of them in. So it seems to me that they have very low um, levels of C-reactive protein. That means a uh, you know, low level of inflammation. They're also having good uh, levels of lipids. They have good levels of hemoglobin A1C. And you're also talking about activation of immune pathways by genetics, so to summarize, right? So yeah. uh, Swami, you were a um, uh, nephrology expert and also the uh, researcher in the immunology uh, world. How do you think, um, if a meditator, any kind of meditator actually is well prepared for the for facing this COVID situation. Can you tie this all up? Right, yeah. Thank you, Bala, and uh, Namaskaram Sadhguru Namaskaram. Uh, for the great opportunity and to be a part of this enlightened panel. So uh, first I want to start with, uh, you know, what COVID does to the body. 
So the virus, you know, initially there is an uh, infectivity of the virus. And then the virus enters the cell through a certain receptor. And once within the body, what it does is that like there are certain immune responses. These are called as like virus restriction factors. So the, one of them is called interferon. If you have sufficient amount of those viral restriction factors or, or immune responses, what uh, it does is that like the host or the human body is able to limit or prevent the virus from infecting. Now, the second phase is that, let's say that the virus eventually is successful in infecting the body, then how do you handle that infection is the second phase of uh, the COVID-19 uh, infection. So there are certain responses that happens. One of them is called as uncontrolled inflammation. It's also called as cytokine storm. And the other thing that happens as a consequence of all this is that like there is damage to the lung and the amount of oxygen in the blood is low, which is called hypoxia. And then once these patients are hypoxic, then they get treated and then they get a supply of oxygen back. Now they are not able to handle that oxygen uh, being given back. It's called reoxygenation. And then that causes more damage uh, to the body. Mm -hmm. And the third uh, thing that happens to the body is that because of the uh, excess inflammation and the hypoxia and hypoxia reoxygenation, which is happening in these patients, there is damage to the blood vessels, the cells that line the blood vessels and this is an excess clotting. So one of the things which uh, people are seeing is that like patients who got COVID-19, they got very high incidence of what is called as thromboembolism, which is nothing but excessive stickiness of the blood or clotting, uh, which is uh, causing them to have organ dysfunction and causing them to die. So this uh, in, in summary kind of uh, summarizes excess inflammation, excess clotting and low oxygen and inability to handle that which is causing this COVID-19 to really kill a lot of people around the world. So now going back to meditation, what happens during meditation? When somebody yeah, is I, meditating... Can I ask you one question in between? Uh, Sadhguru. See, uh, if uh, body is reacting to reoxygenation, so what is the uh, standard protocol that all of you are following for this COVID when somebody comes to hospital in a certain, let's say, reasonably serious condition? Uh, if oxygenation is not the thing to do, what do you do? Right. I mean, that's a, that's a uh, difficult uh, uh, um, thing to treat after the disease has set in, Sadhguru. Because once there is hypoxia, and then yeah, hypoxia itself is harmful to the body, mm. then you have to correct the hypoxia, then reoxygenation is bound to happen. And as of now, we still don't have a complete understanding or have any therapy to really uh, prevent this cascade of events. Mm -hmm. So you are forced to treat the hypoxia, but you don't have a way to really prevent this reoxygenation injury from happening. But uh, from previous studies, uh, we know that there are like many interventions that can actually limit the reoxygenation injury while we correct the hypoxia. And uh, one of the key pathways that is relevant in preventing this reoxygenation injury is antioxidant responses. So if you, if your innate ability to deal with oxidative stress, otherwise it's called free radicals. And there are like mechanisms in the body to deal with the free radicals. If those responses are empowered by any mechanism, whether it is through drug or whether it is through eating or whether it is through meditation, then your ability to handle that reoxygenation induced free radical damage may be more effective. And there are other things like people have tried like, you know, vitamin C or vitamin E and all kinds of chemical strategies, which can also be used to limit the reoxygenation injury. Mm -hmm. But I want to add one more thing, Sadhguru, which could be really interesting. And what the studies have shown is that people uh, who do uh, proper yogic and meditation practices, and at least in one study, they have looked at and shown that glutathione, which is a critical molecule to prevent a free radical injury within the cell, the levels of it is significantly increased days or weeks after they start this practice. Mm -hmm. So definitely uh, in terms of like uh, preventing the uh, free radical injury or reoxygenation injury, uh, uh, the meditation and yogic practices uh, do really help. So one of the things Swami is, um, I just wanted to add, 
which is obvious, I think you know it, but just for the viewers purposes that you just give enough oxygen that is required to keep their oxygenation levels sufficient, right? Suppose in hypoxia, you don't give 100% oxygen, just give as much as required to keep it on 94%. Okay, go ahead. Exactly. Yeah, because hypoxia, having a low oxygen itself is harmful to the body, right? And so you have to correct the hypoxia, but you have to empower the body to handle the free radical that is going to come from reoxygenation. So that's one aspect of it. Now, going back to the whole uh, aspect of what happens with the meditation and a little bit I'll touch on Samyama also, what we know from preliminary data, is that like the first thing that uh, these practices seem to do, uh, what Sandil uh, alluded and Vijay has generated data is that like, it is activating the genes which are critical for restricting the coronavirus from infecting the cell. How do we know that? Uh, we have samples on Samyama volunteers before they started the practice, and then at 48 hours after they did the practice, and then at three months after. And when we went and looked at like thousands of gene signatures, and then it turns out the set of genes which are linked to this uh, viral restriction, otherwise the interferon pathway, seem to be directly activated in people who are doing Samyama. So this data is like really, really exciting. So you and mean the eight-day meditation retreat, right? Swami, sorry to interrupt. So just the eight-day meditation. Eight-day yeah. meditation retreat, exactly. And uh, so in fact, like one of the articles like we referred is that like, you know, there is one particular paper where they showed when they take the SARS-CoV virus too and infect what are called organoids, they are trying to create a model like what happens in human. The set of genes that are activated by the SARS-CoV virus and organoids that is the protection which the body is trying to do are the same genes that are getting activated in the Samyama participants at uh, two or three days after they started this practice. The second set of things which is really interesting and useful also is that like at three months after they finished this seven day program, the antioxidant response genes are the ones which are most potently activated uh, in, in their body. So not only we are having uh, the viral restriction or uh, balanced immune response, but also the protective response for the cells are also getting activated uh, in, 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 in this uh, uh, practitioners of this. So this, and there are previous studies in other meditators also, people have published, and again, really showing that uh, ability to handle a viral infection is uh, specifically um, those pathways are activated in people who are doing like practice of meditation mm -hmm. and yoga. It, uh, <laughs> I know you guys are looking at it technically in this way, but let me share my experience. Uh, it's almost thirty-nine years now uh, since I've been traveling. This is the first time I'm staying home for over forty days in last nearly forty years. <laughs> Always I've been traveling and almost every day I have a public event. Uh, hardly there is one day where there are no events. So in spite of that, in these thirty-nine years, uh, I've never cancelled a single event because I'm not well. So obviously it must be working. So I'm... Uh, for me, uh, 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 this is good enough proof, but I know medically you have to prove all these things, these inflammation markers, and whatever is happening in the neurological, uh, you know, uh, signatures that it is leaving. And of course the genetic changes, because in yoga there is a way of saying it. Uh, this may sound a little... Uh, I mean, please uh, look at this in the right perspective, because uh, for, uh, for our other friends uh, who are uh, f uh, from the Western culture, please look here this carefully, because otherwise it will mean something else. We say, uh, you must keep your parents alive on the outside, but you must kill them inside. <laughs> that is within you, the genetic data that's come from them, you must kill it. Outside, you must treat them well and keep them alive, so that they are alive by themselves, you are alive by yourself. But otherwise, it will continue. All the factors, good, bad, ugly, everything continues. So. The entire yogic system is oriented towards this, that you want to kill your parentage within yourself. You want to keep them alive outside, but within you they must die. This may sound too drastic, but without this a human being will not blossom. Without this, this will not become a fresh life, 
with all its possibilities. Well, I don't know whether uh, COVID will uh, let me live or let me die, that is not even a concern. But the thing is, everything that is needed for, uh, what to say, a flourishing life to exist in the body will naturally happen with these practices. The practices are life-oriented. Measurements, you can come up with your own measurements in various ways, I know. Scientifically, it is useful, but essentially people want to be healthy and well. Uh, Thank the you, main Sadhguru. Thank you. Go ahead, yeah, the, the main purpose is uh, we all have experienced uh, 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 going through all these meditation programs. It's a matter of convincing um, the whole humanity about uh, the meditation and its benefits. So we are trying to publish all these uh, evidences in manuscripts no. and... No, 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 it's very access. necessary. I'm not trying to say it's not necessary. It's very essential in today's world, absolutely essential. So that the more people can take this upon and uh, benefit from it. Thank you, Santhal, and thank you, Swami. Uh, Santhal is again a full professor of uh, pediatrics and pediatric pain at the Indiana University, and Swami is uh, associate professor of medicine and is moving to Mayo Clinic soon, right? Thank you both for your yes. inputs regarding the uh, protection that we can get because of regular practices. Thank you very much. Like to... No point do I think uh, medical research is useless. No, I'm not saying that. I'm no, saying no. Uh, because I'm uneducated, I can only feel what happens in my body. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we are trying to uh, show the world uh, what you're uh, experiencing, what uh, you uh, make others experience, so that everyone can benefit. So, uh, I thank you very much, Sadhguru, for doing that. No, no, if you check my blood now, all the drug addicts will be after you. <laughs> Don't publish my results. Yeah, which is good, so they won't uh, get addicted to the drug, they will get addicted to the meditation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Santhal and Swami. Thank you. And Thank you very Guru. much. And yeah. I would like to bring in uh, Steve Pratt, who's um, the director of pre-anesthesia testing in our hospital, Beth Israel Dickness Medical Center. He has been a, my colleague for almost uh, 25 years. Um, so Steve Pratt also runs the Massachusetts Peer Review. And uh, Steve, go ahead. Good morning, Steve. Um, good morning. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for having me. It's a great honor. I think that the reason that Bala asked me to be included in this or allowed me to be included was because I've been doing some work over the past 10 years to help clinicians uh, um, recover emotionally after difficult events. Healthcare can be an emotionally difficult um, time. We, we make mistakes and that can cost people lives. Even without mistakes, things happen and we have to watch great suffering. And helping our co colleagues to recover from those emotions, the stressful times is becoming more and more important as we understand the huge emotional impacts that this can have. COVID is having a remarkable set of emotional impacts on our clinicians, um, almost to the same degree as the medical impacts that it's having on our, on our patients. Um, our, our folks, our, our staff are terrified that they could become sick themselves and die or bring bring the disease home to their loved ones. There's a sense of guilt, both of those who are working because they feel guilty that their other colleagues are being furloughed or those that were at home, they feel guilty because they're not at the front lines helping. There's been a sense of great incompetence because people feel they don't know what to do to take care of their patients. Which, which gloves should I be wearing on day to day? And then of course the great sadness as we watch unimaginable amounts of suffering and death, often alone, people dying without their loved ones. So it's it's a whole new emotional experience for our staff. As clinicians, we've learned to keep many of those feelings at arm's distance because we have to keep them there in order to continue to work. And I'm actually worried that once we get to the other end of this, to the other side of this, that those feelings are gonna have to bubble up some way that those feelings that we've kept buried so that we continue to continue to do our job on a day-to-day -day basis will eventually have to come up. And I'm wondering, sir, what, what advice you would give to us as leaders to help our staff to manage, to unwrap those feelings as they start to come up when we give ourselves the opportunity to actually feel them, when we have the moment to pause and say, 
and, and realize how emotionally humongous this has been for the last days, weeks, months, or potentially even years. How can we help our staff to bring those feelings back up in a safe way? I very much understand and uh, appreciate the tremendous work that uh, both the doctors and the nursing staff and the allied staff around in the hospitals are doing. It's uh, unfortunate there are, uh, you know, in UK, 44 percent of the medical staff uh, is showing signs of depression. In China, 50 percent they're saying, in Singapore, 40 percent. I don't know what is uh, the thing in United States, I'm sure there are similar numbers. So when half the people who are responsible for, uh, you know, bringing the population out of this pandemic with limited amount of damage and limited loss of life are going through this, this is… this doesn't bode well either for the medical staff or for the larger population. So it's very important that they are well taken care of as a part of this. From our end, we did uh, whatever we could do. Uh, today, uh, I think uh, a few hundred thousand people are going through this that we offered this inner engineering program free of cost to all medical personnel across the world. A few hundred thousand people have enrolled, but it's important that everybody goes through this. These are seven powerful sessions, all of it allied practices attached, simple things that you invest twelve to fifteen minutes a day and it'll make a big difference. The doctors, uh, Swami and uh, Shantil were just talking about it, how they are measuring it in their own uh, ways. But uh, I must tell you, this will work hundred percent because this will change the fundamental chemistry of who we are. They were uh, using scientific language, but let me put it in my own little uneducated way of saying this. All I know is you can make your chemistry blissful, no matter what is the situation we face. When we face hard situations, when you face difficult situations, that is the time when we need at most balance within ourselves, our intelligence, our competence must work at its best. But if we are distressed or depressed, definitely our competence levels will go down. This will not only affect our lives, unfortunately it may cost some other life. And when it costs some other life because of our incompetence, then uh, there is a cycle of problems that an individual will naturally go through. When we realize that what we have done has uh, gone wrong for somebody else's life, because it's not nice for any human being to put in a position to determine whether somebody should live or die, that should never come. But unfortunately, uh, in the profession that you are, maybe on a daily basis you are facing that situation. And particularly now with the pandemic, uh, it is far more because uh, we have still not figured out what is the solution for this. And about uh, post-pandemic, how will we be? But a whole lot of scientists are saying there is no such thing as post-pandemic. We just have to learn to live with this virus <laughs> like we have lived with HIV and we have la lived with uh, yearly influenza and whatever. Similarly, we will have to just live with this. But uh, I mean, I don't want to give you a medical lecture, but all of us know the problem with this virus is not necessarily its uh, ability to take lives. The problem with this uh, virus is, it is hidden. It is… Uh, it can be in you or me without showing any signs. That is a big danger, that it passes from person to person without uh, really making one person sick but killing the next person. So that is where the danger is. But with other infections that we had like influenza and other things, very easily, immediately the symptoms were showing up, naturally they would stay away and things like that. So this is the danger of this, though it is not as uh, virulently fatal as the other things are, this is really dangerous because it is camouflaged most of the time, you don't know. So having said that, about what people go through uh, as medical professionals, making… Uh, as I already uh, said, we never make perfect decisions, we make decisions believing we are doing the right thing, but if it goes wrong, and especially if it goes wrong to cost somebody else's life, that is a hard thing to live for anybody. But the most important thing is, right now, when the world is facing a situation like this, medical professionals must be in the best state of mind and body 
This is very, very important. This is why as a part of this, we are offering this Inner Engineering online for everybody and various other practices which are very simple to do. Please, uh, all of you try and see and p p put it across to all the doctors and nurses. It will make a huge difference. In UK, many doctors have done this and they are sharing what difference it's made. A simple practice of twelve minutes, how the immune system is up, protecting you. At the same time, it also uh, keeps up your mood levels. It will create a balance, emotional balance and a sense of… Uh, a sense of blissfulness within you. Because as uh, you're all doctors, all of you are very clear on this, human experience has a chemical basis to it. Now we are talking about a technology with which we can create a chemistry of blissfulness. This is most important because only when you are in a pleasant state of experience, this body and this mind functions at its best. And right now all of you functioning… functioning at your very best is vital for so many lives. So it's my wish and my blessing that all of you should stay healthy, function at the best of your competence so that many more lives are not taken uh, because we still have not figured out a way with the vi virus. We are only trying to figure out how to dodge it, how to manage it. We don't really have a solution as such. So your work and your emotional balance and your own well-being and the well-being of your families is very vital for the rest of the population also. Please, keeping this in mind, keep yourself well. Thank, thank you, you so much, much. Sadhguru. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. And I thank all the panelists for coming today and participating in this because I think it's been very educational for me. And thank you, uh, thank you for taking time out and uh, taking part in this. And thank Isha Foundation for co-hosting this event. And I thank all the viewers from all over the world uh, looking at this. And I also thank my family, etc., to be a great support throughout this um, organization process. Thank you again. And we have research that is ongoing, a couple of research projects that are there um, based on the simple practices that Sadhguru alluded to. Take part in it, inquire about it, and we are trying to uh, let other people know. And right now, it's the inner engineering online that he's talking about is free for all the medical uh, practitioners. Thank you so much. Thank Namaskar. you very much. Thank Namaskar. You. Thank you so much. And, uh, mm -hmm.